Please be seated and turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament portion that was read to us, the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to John. And I direct your attention particularly to the portion that follows on from where we left off last week. We begin again then at verse 17. 17, where Jesus says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Again, let's see all this in the broadest context of the Gospel of John. What is John concerned about? Well, he wants to write the message of the Christian faith as seen in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the eternal word or wisdom of God who has become incarnate. God sending forth his son to bring the message of mercy and salvation to a sinful, rebellious world. Because God so loves us, contrary to our deserving, and he is not willing that we should perish, and therefore he has sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. And this is to be the agenda. Uh, The gospel is the mandate, if you like, for the church in the beginning and right down to this moment in time. So throughout all our Saviour's teaching and example, what has he been doing? He's been preparing the disciples. What's he now doing in John 17? He's praying for the disciples and for others in later generations. And the subjects that uh, he touches upon, again, he's really clarifying for our benefit, I believe. That's the reason why we have John 17. It's for our edification and for our direction and for our encouragement. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is really clarifying his concerns, what is most upon his heart. And as I tried to say last Lord's Day morning, his concerns will be our concerns. We won't tamper with his agenda. We won't modify or presumptuously seek to improve what he has said. The church has got into terrible trouble when it's done just such a thing. And uh, I have tried to divide up the chapter, and I have done so with a series of single word headings. We've considered uh, the authority with which he spoke, the sovereignty with which he acted according to the grace of God in the affairs of people. We've seen the particularity of his purposes. We've seen the security of his people. You and me, God's people in every age and generation. And that's what we looked at last Lord's Day morning. And then I use the word insularity in the sense that we need protection from the world. We are to be insular, not in the sense of having nothing to do with other people. I try to explain that uh, very simply, but importantly, last Lord's Day morning. But we need protection, we need insulation, uh, that we might be uncontaminated from the wickedness of the world. And then I concluded last Lord's Day morning uh, under the title Felicity, that the Lord Jesus Christ wants his people to be supremely happy and joyful because there is intense and ecstatic joy within the unity of the Trinity in heaven. There always has been. And that's what we have been redeemed to eventually partake of in the glory. But it begins now in this world. We have a taste of it. Revivals, if you like, reformations, when the Spirit of God works powerfully Uh, through the preaching of the gospel, they are foretastes, if you like, of the ultimate blessedness which is to be ours. And that is what uh, Jesus spoke about in verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This morning, we're concerned with three other Important words. And what are they? Well, very simply, we have sanctity, universality, and unity. Three big issues. And I intend to 
as much as possible, simplify and compress the great teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ which we have in this particular chapter. So where do we begin this morning? Well, we begin with what Jesus says in verses 16 to 19. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for your sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Again, we keep in mind that at this point in the prayer, Jesus is praying for the disciples, or at least, should we say, 11 of them. And we have noticed the importance uh, of this. And yet everything that Jesus has prayed for the disciples also apply in principle to every believer down the running centuries, as the rest of this chapter very clearly demonstrates. So we understand then that when he said in verse 9, I pray for them, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. He's thinking at that point in the prayer for the disciples. Now we see, and you may remember the picture that I set before you, the, the pebble effect, the ripple effect. When a splash is made and then there are ripples that go out, Jesus begins his praying for his own, for the disciples. And then his requests go wider and become more extensive, as we see very clearly in a moment. But we must begin with his prayer for the the sanctification of the disciples. The sanctification of the disciples. Sanctify them, he says to the Father, by your truth. Sanctify them by your truth. He's talking about our sanctity, our sanctification. Now, this is an important word. It's an important and very doctrinal word which we have to understand very carefully. Because there are two great words, if you like, or at least three, if we include glorification. But John Calvin was, I believe, quite right to say that The truths of justification and sanctification are the two main points of our salvation. The way that salvation comes to us and the way it is experienced and the way it grows in our lives and experience. But there's a big difference between justification and sanctification. Let me put it simply to you. Justification is all about our standing before God. Sanctification is about our state, our personal condition, if you like. Justification is all about the free forgiveness of our sins, by which we have peace with God. As Paul says in Romans 5.1, and we have in our liturgy, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And to be justified means to be declared righteous, to be acquitted from every accusation of the law against us when we trust totally and completely as the catechism reminded us in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ his sacrifice upon the cross is always the the heart of Christian faith and experience we focus upon the message of the cross by which alone we're reconciled to God because thereon the Lord Jesus died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God so the cross is absolutely fundamental and that is why the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ alone is so fundamental to a true understanding of the Christian faith. But sanctification is the work of the Spirit in us. The enlightenment which comes to our minds. The purifying of our sinful hearts. The redirection of our wayward wills to walk in the ways of the Lord, in all the aspects of our Christian life. So it's not enough to be justified, to be saved. We also have to be sanctified, because we must possess that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, as we read in Hebrews chapter 12. 
What does it mean then to be sanctified? Well, very simply, it means to be set apart from all that is unholy. Jesus was very conscious that his disciples were going out into the world and we are living in the world and we're living in the midst of much that is unholy and corrupt and foul and vulgar. You know as well as I do, I don't need to give any examples. We hear them. They're around us all the time. And the work of salvation is to separate us from all that, from the contamination, from the the decadence and so on and so forth. And that's basically what sanctification is all about, that God sanctifies his people by separating them, setting them apart from the corruptions of the world, that we might be a holy people unto the Lord. Not holy in the sense of being falsely self-righteous because it's his righteousness which brings us peace with God and salvation. But when God works in the hearts of his people, he justifies them when they trust in the precious blood of Jesus and he sanctifies us when he works within us by his Holy Spirit. What uh, we cannot miss, and it's very, very clear, is that the Lord Jesus Christ specifies the means whereby we're sanctified. The means whereby we're sanctified. He says in verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now what's this really saying? Now we know that the word doctrine is not very popular in certain uh, church circles. They prefer experience to doctrine. They don't want teaching. They don't have the appetite for that teaching but um, what an insult that is to the Holy Spirit when you think that um, the Holy Spirit led the writers of the New Testament to say so much about holy Christian living about sanctified living almost all the epistles of the New Testament they begin with a doctrinal section in which our need of salvation and the saving work of Christ is set forth and then you come across a therefore when there's teaching to lead us and to guide us so that we might live, live out the gospel in the light of the teaching that we have had. So if the Holy Spirit has gone to all the trouble through the apostles and the New Testament writers to reveal to us all the teaching that there is, uh, we ought to be very concerned. What did I say? Our concerns or his concerns should be our concerns. And Jesus is very plain here. Uh, He's virtually saying, Don't think that when I send the Holy Spirit upon you, you'll not need to think and search and learn my word. You could almost imagine, can't you, And uh, as if the Holy Spirit simply comes down and uh, takes us over and then we're sanctified and that's it. Well, that is not the way that God works. But the Holy Spirit does work because he's inspired the scriptures. We have the word and therefore Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true truth I'm reminded that um, E.J. Young the eminent American scholar he wrote a book on the authority of the Bible and reflecting the authorised version translation at this point he called his book Thy Word is Truth that's exactly what Jesus is saying here your word is truth the word of God the holy scriptures, the inspired word of God, unique in its character and its uh, authority. So if the means is the truth revealed, the tool is the word of God, the scriptures. That's why we should be so thankful that we have Bibles, why we should be so thankful for those like William Tyndale, who gave their lives, who suffered so much that we might have the scriptures in our own tongue translated from the Hebrew and the Greek, so that we might learn the doctrine which will, in the hands of the Spirit, sanctify us and make us the kind of Christians that we ought to be. And we cannot deny that this is such a vital thing. It's neglected by too many people. But can I just quickly remind you of the problems that Isaiah was facing in his generation 
because there was a, a backsliding among Israel and among, amongst uh, the people of Judah. And they preferred to listen to the false prophets and the false oracles and not the faithful prophets and the true word of God that had come through Moses uh, and, the, and the others. And there were great problems. There was idolatry, there was wickedness, there was evil uh, permeating the whole of society. People were turning, for example, to spiritualism and various other false cults and religions. And this is what Isaiah had to say. Uh, to the Lord and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And that's the whole issue. When God's word is not taught and proclaimed, then all the other evils and falsehoods and corruptions that follow on that will be commonplace. That was the situation at that particular time. That's Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. And then fast forwarding to the New Testament, we remember that uh, the Apostle Paul in his final letter, so the scholars inform us, his second letter to Timothy, Paul was saying to Timothy, we're living in challenging times. People don't want the truth. They want lots of other things, but they don't want the truth. They don't want the word, and you've got to be prepared for that. And in our day and generation, we need the exhortation which Paul gave to Timothy. So we have the added complication that we live in a time of dumbing down. When a lot of people professing Christians, they don't want to read or understand their Bibles. They don't want the preaching of God's truth. But listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, if they love false doctrine, but not sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. In other words, Timothy, you'll not be very popular if you pursue this way. But it's God's way. It's Christ's way because he said, sanctify them through your truth. So he says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So Paul doesn't promise Timothy an easy ride in his ministry. And so it has been right down the centuries of the Christian church. Right down to the present time. And this partly explains why true Christianity is not making the headway that it ought in the hearts and lives of many people. So the Lord Jesus Christ is reminding us of the importance of doctrine, the importance of God's word. Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth and he's concerned to emphasize what we really need and this must always be a vital emphasis in the church not just to be justified but to be sanctified by the truth I think it's true to say that the doctrine of sanctification or holiness is perhaps the Cinderella of Christian truths she's kept down in the basement not seen and yet So vital is it that this should be a dominant emphasis in all our Christian understanding and indeed in our appetites. Can I ask you, my dear friends this morning, do you rejoice at the idea of being forgiven? Pardoned? You're a child of God because you trust in Jesus? Well, that's a wonderful thing, but it's only half the picture. Do you also desire to be sanctified, to be holy? To be conformed to the image of God's Son. You see the importance because this is what Jesus is praying here at this particular moment. And let's not forget also that uh, doctrine requires the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is given by the Holy Spirit. As I pointed out to you before, it's striking that our Lord Jesus Christ, whenever he starts to talk about the Holy Spirit, and I ask you, What do people think about when they hear the expression Holy Spirit? 
But this is what Jesus said whenever he spoke about him, as he does in John 14, 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The spirit of truth. And then again in chapter 15 and verse 13. Uh, he says uh, there that um, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who will reveal my Father's will to you, which is the work of the Holy Spirit to do that very same thing. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So it's important for us to see that. And that's why we should always have such a great confidence in the scriptures. There's a lot of nervousness with regard to, you know, can we really proclaim the Bible in the way that Christians did from the beginning and throughout the great ages of the church because there's so much skepticism and so forth. But what the church has got to rediscover is surely the spirit of Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation. My conscience is captive to the word of God. A church which doesn't share that conviction will not be a church that God can honour and bless and use. No, no. And then we think of John Wesley, who in his great ministry in the 18th century, he declared that he was a man of one book. That was his authority in which he proclaimed uh, the gospel. Charles Haddon Spurgeon also made the point about the question uh, whether we should defend the Bible. Now, there is a place for scholarly discussion of serious problems of understanding. That's not for one moment being questioned. But Spurgeon encourages us to be a lot more bold when he says, defend the Bible, I'd sooner defend a tiger. Open the cage. Let it out. It can defend itself. So we ought not to be intimidated or held back by the questions that sometimes people put to us, you know, um, about various events and, and truths in, in the scriptures. Yes, we must seek to understand them and answer people's questions, but let's be confident that this holy book is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth. And as this is the Holy Spirit's in us, he uses the means of his truth, he uses the word as a tool, uh, we have our part to play as well. And these two things are really brought together very powerfully uh, in um, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Listen to this now. 1 Peter 1 verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren... Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now those statements by the Apostle Peter, they brings all these threads together, doesn't it? We must obey the truth through the Spirit. That's exactly what Jesus is telling us there. And that being the case, it becomes a reality what Peter concludes with in his second letter, in 2 Peter 3.18, where he says that we should grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see the importance of this. Here it is. Sanctity. Our sanctity. The sanctity of the people of God. So vital uh, is this. Which leads us on secondly to what I've called universality. Universality. I've touched on this before. I've tried to explain that the universality of John 3.16 is not contradicted by the seeming particularity of John 17 verse 9. We've seen that uh, before. Uh, Richard Baxter was right to say that although Jesus was praying at that moment for the disciples... He does have other prayers for others later on in the prayer. But now we take up this thought about universality in this particular sense that let's not forget again what is Jesus praying for. As if he's saying, Father, these disciples of mine, they're going out into the world. They have a message for the world that you, Father, have so loved the world that you have given your 
only Son, myself, to them for their salvation, that they might believe upon me and find salvation. Isn't that what Jesus says in verse 18 there? As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. There is this emphasis upon the universality of the gospel. Which is another way of saying that uh, the gospel involves offers of grace, the universal free offer of salvation. That is why um, we read in John 12 and verse 47, again our Saviour's emphasis at that particular point. He says, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. It's very clear, isn't it? The universality of our Lord's concern. Yes, there is particularity in terms of the necessity of the sovereign work of the Spirit to bring a dead, rebellious sinner to faith and repentance. But we don't begin there. We begin with the offer of salvation and of universal offered mercy. It's that surely behind our Lord's great commission shortly before he ascended, as recorded by Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. But go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We have a message for everyone in the world. That's really what Jesus is emphasizing at that particular point. So there is then that universality which is emphasized, and we must never lose sight of that emphasis. And that is what the disciples needed. They were going out into this wide world. And what he says there, uh, we also need uh, in our own experience. And we can see the developing universality of his concern uh, in these later verses. In verse 20, for example, he says, I do not pray for these alone. See, this is the second ripple, if you like, from the, the pebble picture. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So they will preach the gospel. And many others will come to believe in me through their preaching, through their teaching, through their testimony. And Jesus is very concerned that all those who are thus in succeeding decades and centuries will be gathered in to the unity of the church, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Notice here, Jesus is emphasizing this universality of concern. It's a fundamental evangelistic emphasis which ought to be the mark of the church. That's what Jesus is emphasizing here. And then we can see it goes even further, doesn't it? He says in verse 22, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. See the emphasis there. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying so powerfully and so wonderfully in that. So that should be the concern. That's his concern. And it should be our concern as well. Yes, we believe in the truth of election. Jesus has taught that in John chapter 6 particularly. But we're not to be a, a navel-gazing group of the frozen and chosen. We should be concerned with that universal dimension in seeking to take the gospel out to others. So what have we seen then? Sanctity, universality, and third and last, unity. Unity. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about here in verses 21 to 23. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That they may be one just as we are one. I touched on this last Lord's Day morning, didn't I? Where the perfect unity within the, the Trinity, between Father, Son and Spirit, is meant to be something which the Church, the redeemed, partake of. And hence our Lord's prayer That we might be one. What a vital prayer that is. 
And yet when one turns to the subject of unity, we run into serious problems. Because we look at church history and we see that there have been so many scandalous examples of disunity. The Christian church in so many respects has failed in this particular regard. And there's no getting away from that. I think the older I get, the more do I feel if ever there was a, an English minister of the gospel who was distressed at the, the disunity of the people of God, the divisions and the hard thoughts and the excommunicating of one another, that preacher was Richard Baxter. It's rather interesting to note, I think, that there is far more unity within our hymn books than there is in perhaps confessions of faith. Baxter was so distressed at the sectarian proliferation in churches in the 17th century England. He said, why can't we all agree on the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed? Let's come together on that basis and tolerate one another's difference on other things. He was concerned, therefore, to express the concern of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be one. And I'm afraid that poor old Baxter got caught in the crossfire because he antagonised some on one extreme and he antagonised others on the opposite extreme. But extremism on so many issues has been the problem of the Christian church, which has led to this kind of disunity. Can I just read to you what Baxter says on this particular verse? He's paraphrasing our Lord's Prayer that we might be one. This is what he says. It's the most powerful and clear, and and his heart's desire throbs through almost every word. He says, May all speak the same thing, which they have heard from thee by me, Jesus to the Father, of course, and may love what we love and do our work and not their own that by their concord in faith, love and practice the world may be won to Christianity and not scandalised by their discord and fractions or by forsaking the true unity and combining for worldly interest on worldly terms. That is a terrific statement. And he surely brings out the heart of what Jesus is saying in this particular prayer. Let's not forget, I do believe that the unity of the people of God is achieved in response to our Saviour's prayer. It is not we who make the unity, it is he by his grace But we are exhorted to endeavour to preserve the unity, to express the unity. And that, I fear, is where there has been so much failure throughout the history of the Christian church. And yet there have been some happier expressions where things have gone contrary to human nature. For example, now, the Roman Catholic Church would say to us, wouldn't they, well, you Reformed Christians, you who believe in the Reformation, Did you not tear the seamless robe of Christ in shreds with all your divisions and your denominations? What do we say to that? What do you say to that? Oh yes, that is certainly the case, but uh, sadly we have repeated to a degree what you in your church in the Middle Ages have done because you had so many orders, you had the Benedictines and the Augustinians and the Cistercians and the Trappists and people like that. Uh, with all their different views, their different monastic orders, their different schools of thought. No, Rome was as divided, if not worse, during the Middle Ages. And what would they then say? Ah, but we're all one under the Pope, despite our differences. To which we then reply, yes indeed. But all true Christians are united under Christ, despite the differences that there are between us. Differences which ought not to be. We ought to be together in visible expression as well as mind and heart. But we do acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church. That's why the reformers 
spoke about papists and Christians. They weren't being rude, they were simply saying that true that Roman Catholics follow the Pope, whereas Christians follow Christ. And that's important that we understand this particular point. So it's simply not true that the reformers were not interested in Christian unity. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, Archbishop Cranmer. He sent out a, a call to the reformed leaders of Europe to come together for a, a, a synod to express their desire for unity in the gospel, to discuss their differences. And John Calvin was invited by Cranmer to come to England. To which John Calvin replied that he would love to come. He would be willing to cross ten seas if it were possible to pursue such a noble end. Sadly, his health was not good enough and he no way he could travel and it wasn't long before he died, although Thomas Cranmer was martyred by the papists because of his reformed uh, convictions. So there was a desire for unity. We mustn't deny that for one uh, moment. And then again in England, when you think of John Hooper, the Bishop of Gloucester, he was really the sort of the father of Puritanism in many ways within the Church of England. And he disagreed with um, Nicholas Ridley, who was the martyred Bishop of London. Bishop Ridley wasn't objecting to the retention of priestly robes uh, and um, so on and so forth. Hooper said, we should scrap them, get rid of them. They disagreed over that. The vestments controversy, it was known. But when they were both arrested, when they were both in prison, facing eternity... The big things of the gospel brought these contestants together. So Ridley then wrote to Hooper and said, I want you to know, brother, that I heartily love you. It's a very warming, it's a wonderful letter from which I'm, I'm quoting. So there have been those who recognize that over and above differences, we recognize that true and essential um, unity. One more example I can give you. One of the greatest causes for division in the Reformed faith from the Reformation, even down to the present, was the big difference over Arminianism and Calvinism. John Wesley followed the Arminian teaching. George Whitfield, the Calvinist teaching, as it was understood at that particular time. And um, it caused a great deal of unhappiness and distress Philip Doddridge, bless him, did his best in the spirit of Richard Baxter to bring these men together. He died before he could do much more, did Philip Doddridge. But as it were, he stood between Wesley and Whitfield and wanted to put his arms on the shoulders of both of them and bring them together on the basis of the scriptures. But later on in that century, there was another godly man in the Church of England called Charles Simeon. Charles Simeon of Cambridge, who before J.C. Ryle, who as Spurgeon says was the, the best man in the Church of England towards the end of the 19th century, but um, Charles Simeon was uh, a godly man in Cambridge. He too was persecuted by the liberals and the ecumenists of that particular time. But um, in 1784, the elderly John Wesley came to Cambridge and he met Charles Simeon and there was a very interesting conversation between them which I think is very wonderful. And um, this is the account that Charles Simeon wrote of his meeting with John Wesley. He says, Sir, I understand that you are called an Arminian and I have been sometimes called a Calvinist and therefore I suppose we are to draw daggers. But before I consent to begin the combat, with your permission, I will ask you a few questions. Pray, sir, do you feel yourself a depraved creature, so depraved that you would never have thought of turning to God if God had not first put it into your heart? Yes, says the veteran Wesley, I do indeed. 
And do you utterly despair of recommending yourself to God by anything you can do and look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Christ? Yes, solely through Christ. But, sir, Simeon goes on, supposing you were first saved by Christ, are you not somehow or other to save yourself afterwards by your own good works? No, replied Wesley. I must be saved by Christ from first to last. Allowing then that you were first turned by the grace of God, are you not in some way or other to keep yourself by your own power? No. What then are you to be upheld every hour and every moment by God as much as an infant in its mother's arms? Yes, altogether, said Wesley. And is all your hope in the grace and mercy of God to preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom? Yes, I have no hope but in him. Then, sir, said Simeon, with your leave, I will put up my dagger again. For this is all my Calvinism. This is my election, my justification by faith, my final perseverance. It is in substance all that I hold, and as I hold it. And therefore, if you please, instead of searching out terms and phrases to be a ground of contention between us, we will cordially unite in those things wherein we agree. That's beautiful. Baxter would say, three cheers. So would Doddridge. But how much it is in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we find here in this passage. So then, we draw to a conclusion by seeing this, that our duty is to endeavour to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, we must do all we can. And these examples I've given you uh, illustrate certainly that great truth. But of course we, we're living in times when these issues, which have caused such great division, they almost pale into relative insignificance when we think of the, the big issues that we're facing. The issues to do with evolution and homosexuality, multi-faith, well, as it were, fighting for the very vitals of Christianity on these levels. And we're living in a time of dumbing down when people aren't interested in a right understanding of truth and experience. But it's all vital. It's all here. It's in our Saviour's prayer. Therefore, we should be concerned about it. We must face the threat, therefore, that I've read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, be ready for trouble, but do your best. Preach the word. Be in season and out of season. And as we seek to do that, we will honour our Saviour's prayer that we should be concerned about the unity of his people to spread the gospel and seek to bring people together. Sadly, there will be differences, but the spirit that we must follow is here set forth by the Lord Jesus Christ. So then it raises the question, what is the heart and the dynamic of our message in the days in which we're living? And I think it comes down to this. That in preaching the gospel we must preach a Bible-based, God-honouring, Christ-exalting, falsehood-refuting, conscience-challenging, sinner-saving, believer-sanctifying gospel. All these things are to be our concern. Because these are the concerns of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not clear? He's concerned about our sanctity. He's concerned that we should preserve the emphasis in gospel endeavour in the world on its universality. He's also concerned that we should express that true unity. So let's keep these things in mind and Pray, Lord Jesus, may my thinking and my speaking and my desiring and my acting be consistent with all that you have set forth 
in this prayer. It's challenging, isn't it? But it's so vital that we grasp it and live accordingly. May God grant these things to be so in our day. As we move now to our final hymn, which is a hymn attributed to John Calvin. It's a beautiful hymn. It majors on the great essentials of the gospel as we face eternity and death. But it also has a very powerful expression regarding the unity of the people of God. It's hymn 124. 124. I greet thee who my sure redeemer art, my only trust and saviour of my heart, who pain didst undergo for my poor sake, I pray thee, from our hearts all cares to take. Him 124. Father, we thank you for the precious teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. May your Holy Spirit apply these things to us so that our thoughts will be his thoughts, our desires shall be his desires, our words his words, and our whole life and witness according to his blessed example. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father And the blessing of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us 
throughout the rest of this our short uncertainly pilgrimage until we come at length to that everlasting rest which our Lord Jesus Christ has purchased for us through his most precious blood. Amen.